We do all kinds of things here at Word in Your Ear. Video casts like this. Podcasts like this. Crowdcast events with famous authors. Live quizzes. And we can guarantee to make your next birthday one you'll never forget. There's only one way to guarantee getting all of this, to getting it before anybody else, and that's to sign on to be a supporter on Patreon. Full details at this address. Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view. Okay, welcome to another Word in your attic. Um, and we're delighted to be joined by, or to join, Steve Carr. Good morning, Steve. Good How morning. Doing? How are we doing? Uh, and where are, are you, Steve? Where do we find you? Um, I'm in Leon C on the on the Thames Delta. As oh, the, right, uh, nice. That's our second. Right. That's our second visit to the Thames Delta. And probably our third visit to the Thames Delta in the. Uh, in the course of doing Word in Your Attic, isn't it? Aren't we? Will, oh, we did Will Birch, didn't we? Uh, Zoe, Zoe Howe. Yeah, Zoe Howe, absolutely. Where, it is a, a small yeah, uh, uh, hotbed of um, literary and music loving people. Right. And I'm sort of trying to, you know, ease my way into that, really. A bit of, a, a bit of a, an outsider, a bit of an usurper, really. But. <laughs> <laughs> so what brings Steve here is, uh, your, well, your blog, Every Record Tells a Story. And... Uh, and most recently, you published a book. Tell I us about the book. That's very kind of you to mention it. Here, here Go is on. a copy. Um, <laughs> away. We might as well just get that in there, mightn't we? No, absolutely. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> so this is, uh, I, I wrote a, a book. Um, it's called Every Record Tells a Story, a vinyl handbook. Um, and the premise of it is effectively that uh, there's a bit of a vinyl culture out there at the moment where people are um, getting very excited about what is a fairly old format. And, um, you know, we, we chucked away all our records in, in, when CDs came along. And um, then Jack White sort of told us, well, your turntable's not dead. Maybe we should be reviving all these things. And you can tell by uh, your background, David, that perhaps you didn't get rid of all your records. <laughs> entirely. Yeah. Um, but, but for some of us, we did. And so there's now, a, a, vinyl's now coming to a, a new generation of people. Um, and what the blog, the blog started as a way of trying to navigate uh, that that reintroduction to vinyl. There are, there are, the vinyl culture brings lots of interesting uh, new things that we perhaps we didn't have to navigate in the in the 1980s and 70s. Um, posting on Instagram, sort of slightly mawkish pictures of yourself surrounded by Prince records on the anniversary of his death. <laughs> <laughs> and it's, it's the sorts of things that that we should um, you know try. I, I want to guide people past these things to try and find where the, the real nuggets. Uh, and real reasons why we should be interested and excited about vinyl again. Right, no, fair enough. It's really interesting, actually. When I, I published a book, A Fabulous Creation, which is about the era of the, of the vinyl LP. And what, what I... Never heard of it. Very good. Very good. We hadn't what? planned this for you, as yeah, honestly. No, I'm not yeah. plugging the book. I'm just making a point. Uh, when we're trying to get photographs, trying to get photographs of old record shops from the days when there are loads of old record shops is mm -hmm. really hard. You can now find millions of photographs of kind of re, you know, recreated record shops. You know, Paul Weller surrounded by vinyl as, as far as the eye can see, all yeah. shot last week. You know what I mean? Whereas you, you try and find pictures from the 70s or 80s or 60s. It's very well, they were, hard. They were pretty commonplace, weren't they? And apart from anything else, they weren't all that great to look at. Huh? No, they weren't. But remember, but that's the point. Right. Surely people wouldn't have taken those photographs because they didn't quite realise the historic value that was no, going absolutely. to ensue. They just didn't look like an old tip that... Uh, yeah, they were shabby. More likely to find them yeah. in, a, in a sort of historical document and there'll be one just in the yeah, corner. Yeah. Yes, My absolutely. My favourite shot was... Um, Shades Records in St Anne's Court in in um, in Wardour, just off Wardour Street. Right. It, yes. It was. I was very much into um, to heavy rock when I was a, a teenager, and so that was the the place where you could go and buy every um, heavy rock album uh, that ever existed. It's total specialist, but it was in a basement. It's now a, a gym or something, I think. Oh and it yes, was, I know that. And it was just tucked away. And the only way you knew it was there was because you could hear Testament or, or Motley Crue playing. In, uh, and sort of the, the sound of it coming up from the basement very, right. very loudly. Um, so have you, have, you got any, have you got any stuff there to, to do a bit of show and tell with us? Have you got an early purchase of yours? Maybe possibly even the first, the first record, record you ever bought? bought well, the anything, first, right? first record I ever bought uh, was actually by the Beatles. Oh, well. Um, I mean, I say it was the Beatles. It was actually um, uh, the Stars on 45 Beatles <laughs> Megadon. <laughs> oh, and God, I remember that. And uh, when I David say I, I would smash hits at the time, 
<laughs> when I say I bought it, I actually won it in a disco dancing competition at the age of about <laughs> yeah, 10. Yeah. So, um, so the actual, the, the first record I bought was, uh, of my own money was actually ZZ Top's Eliminator, which sort of showed oh, right. where I'm going, yeah. Uh, yeah. the sort of uh, musical path I was taking. Um, but um, there's, there's not an awful lot to say about that. I, I thought I'd bring along um, something which demonstrates why I quite like the, the vinyl side of things. Here you'll see. Right, yeah, um, of course, yes. You know what that is, don't we? That's yeah, that's absolutely off. fantastic. And the brown dirt cowboy. Yeah. Now, inside this, well, I haven't looked and, at and this, this is kind of where the, is a, a scraps booklet. There's a poster, there's a, there's a lyric sheet, but there's also this scraps booklet. And what's nice about this, I think, is it, is it contains a Jackie comic strip. Oh, yes. Uh, reprinted. Um, of uh, El Elton's Elton's uh, rise to fame, isn't Indeed. it? Oh and yes. It, and it, and, it, and it's, what what I rather like about it is the the life and loves of Elton John. Uh, yes. Talking about his relationship with a um, a, a a gypsy girl, which I think it was true actually. Oh, really? um, but um, what I, his fate lay in a waste paper basket, and this mm -hmm. is this is a true story of Elton John, where um, the, the advert came up. And, and, and it, which, is represent, which is reprinted in here, as it happens. The, uh, the, he, he, re, he replied to an advert. Um, there it is on the front. Liberty. It was the Liberty Records. Talent. Right. Yes. And so he replies oh, to that. Oh, this is how he met Bernie. Yes, right. Yeah, yes. Exactly. He, he replies to that and, and um, he, they, they bring him in for an audition. And um, he sort of plays a few songs and they don't like him. They think he's a bit rubbish. So he, they say, OK, well, thanks very much. We don't really have anything for you. So he's a bit disappointed. Um, and this is, this is a good couple of weeks after they put the advert in. And then they say, they feel a bit sorry for him because he's been hanging around the studio a bit. And so they say, well, look, somebody, some kid has just literally just handed in these, um, these lyrics, would you like to see them? Now the story of those, these lyrics are that Bernie Taupin saw the same advert and replied and then lost the letter. And if it hadn't been for Bernie Taupin's mum finding the letter and not throwing it away, hence his fate lay in a waste paper basket. Really? That would never have happened. So we can thank Bernie Taupin's mum for tidying up, finding the letter and then posting it. Um, for the fact that I love those Elton things. and Bernie ever met. And they're also kind of counterfactuals, like the sliding doors moments. You mentioned another one in the book where, where Brian Eno gets on a tube train. And had he not yes. gone into that carriage, he wouldn't have met Andy Mackay. And Andy Mackay starts talking to him and says, uh, we're looking for someone to record this new group we've just formed. And you know, exactly. those things are magical, aren't they? Yeah, and that's you know, and, and, and so hence every record tells a story. This is the, yeah. the yeah, yeah. really of the book. And, and, and these are the sorts of things that, if you, that you don't necessarily pick up um, from, from streaming. I mean, no, no, no. Oh, absolutely, game. definitely. No. I mean, because it, it is it's one of the points I, I, I often return to is that, in the days of records, the thing about records, you used to read them before you bought them. Mm. You know, you, you got information from them by going in the shops and looking in them. And yep. if you were lucky, going, you know, the fold out and so forth. I mean, you wouldn't see the... I'd forgotten that Jackie, uh, that Jackie insert. So that was... The, that, yes, it was there. Because my, my main memory of Captain Fantastic, the Brown Dirt Cowboy, is Elton was so kind of, you know, full of himself at the time that he played Wembley Stadium not long yeah. afterwards and played the whole record in order in front of a, a bunch of people who'd never heard it before. But following, didn't he follow the Beach Boys or somebody? somebody they be, the Beach Boys have been on just done the most blinding set. You know? <laughs> hit after hit That's after right. hit. And now I've got to play obscurity after obscurity after obscurity. <laughs> yeah, yeah. Who and, and do you think went down best? There's obscurities as well, aren't they? I mean, you know, it, it has a couple, it has a couple of uh, songs on it. Someone Saved My Life or whatever it is. I've said but, the best, the best yeah. song is the one about the suicide. <laughs> yeah. That's the high point. <laughs> It's about somebody getting your head out the oven. That's the happy song on that record. <laughs> and, and, a, and again, a true story. He actually did put his head in an oven. Yeah, yeah he did. But, uh, he, but he kept the window open, didn't he? Yeah, the idiot on gas, gas Mark 4. <laughs> <laughs> That's very So he's kind of half-hearted, I think. That's yeah. very good. True, so what true. else you got there, Steve? Okay. So um, exhibit number two. Go on. You, you oh, may have heard of these chaps. The second Rolling Stones album. Very right. well identified because there's no other. Um, uh, now, 
this is a record um, that was that was mentioned in the House of Lords. Oh, right. And I think so. You know, the the story here, and I've I've sort of you know I don't I've written it down slightly so that I can remember some of the details. Um, so it was released in 1965 in January, and Mrs. Gwen Matthews, secretary of the Bournemouth Blind Aid Association. Oh, I know where this is going. <laughs> now, now, why did she take offence? Um, well, I'm going to hold up a, a sort of, um, there we go. Uh, that's, an, that's, that's, an, that's an extract from the sleeve note. It is. And I've got the sleeve here. Now, what it says is, this is the stone's new disc within. Cast deep in your pockets for loot to buy this disc of groovies and fancy words. If you don't have bread, see that blind man, knock him on the head, <laughs> steal his wallet, and lo and behold, you have the loot. If you put in the boot, good, another one sold. Now, you could argue that that's not very nice. <laughs> All and, right, back then, but now we get upset. I mean, yeah, it, yeah, it was yeah, in yeah. the sixties when that sort of thing was acceptable. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. But uh, no, yeah, it, it wasn't. And um, Mrs. Mrs. Uh, Gwen Matthews then um, took offence to that. Uh, you know, even though you know there's some impoverished stones out fans out there who might have needed the money, and she was quoted in the press saying, "They're horrible. It's putting ideas into people's heads." I'm writing to Decker to ask them to change the cover. And then the House of Lords, Lord Conesford. Um, I don't know who Lord Conesford is, but I'm sure he's very important. He asked the Director of Public Prosecutions whether the sleeve constituted a deliberate incitement to criminal action. <laughs> and then the chairman of Decca Records then had to, <clears throat> had to make a comment. He, he said, I'm told this inscription was meant to be humorous, but I'm afraid this jargon doesn't make sense to me. And, and then he arranged for stickers to be placed on some of the sleeves. Now, is, oh, this, really? true? is this true? Well, actually, here's my copy. Oh, what? Oh, you've got an actual sticker. sticker. That's, That's fantastic. Sticker. I've <laughs> never seen that we, before. We sort of scratched, we sort of, somebody sort of scratched it just to see why there was a sticker on there. And it's, because, and it's, a, it's covering oh, up the ending word. That's absolutely brilliant. I mean, that must add to the value of it considerably, doesn't it? I don't, I don't know. They don't, I don't think it really? adds to the... It's not about value, really. It just adds to the yeah. sort of the story of it. Yeah, yeah exactly. that's what's so nice about it. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> that's fine. Now, I remember that. I remember that kind of... Well, it, was, it wasn't a major Ferrari as it would be nowadays. You know, mm. nowadays it'd be on the, be on the BBC... Can't the, remember it. The Absolutely. fourth item or whatever. Whereas this was... This used to get, it got in the it got in the papers, got in the music papers, but nobody yeah. seriously thought Andrew Oldham was suggesting anybody should uh, terrorise, you know, a visually handicapped person or whatever. Yeah. Well, but, that's, uh, and, and good thing too. It would have been a bit. No, tricky. absolutely. But I, I suppose also all that stuff was just grist to the Rolling Stones mill, wasn't it? He's like peeing in the garage right. wall and all that stuff. It was all good for them. You know? all, all publicity is good publicity, they yeah, say. Absolutely. Yeah. So, did you have to seek out that copy, or did you just? Yes, how did you find? I mean, it? how do you find it? Are they rare? Those copies. Well, this was this was a bit of a coincidence. So. Um, I, I, this is part of the, um, what we do in, in the book is, 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 is I have a, a friend of mine and we, we, um, we had a bet and it was really to say, well, we couldn't work out whether we'd actually played any of the early Stones albums or ever actually heard them. And we wonder whether they were just full of old Chuck Berry covers and, and um, whether, it was, whether they were actually any good. They're really so good. What we did was, yeah, so, we, so we bought them and um, we went out, bought them and then played them and listened to them and decided whether or not it was, it was worth doing so. And um, so this was the one I bought for, I don't know, 10, 15 quid, whatever it was in, in uh, the Spitalfields record market. So I didn't at the time go, right, I'm going to seek out one with a right, stick. Right, I was so I just, just I just bought it. I just found the, the, the one that might be the, you know, in, in, in half decent nick. It's got a, you know, nice big red yeah, yeah, yeah. label, whatever. Red um, mon mono label. Uh, yeah, yeah, I think it is a mono one. Yes, it is, because the, the sticker covers up the mono sign. Yeah, uh, yeah, there. yeah. And yes, because is it green stereo? I don't know. No, actually, it's, uh, that was the inner bag. Sorry, I'm getting that confused. That was slightly no, no. later on. Anyway, go on, carry on, carry on. Well, yeah, so, this is so, precisely um, the kind of conversation we should be having. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> what what colour it was for it's all Mono and... for us, won't it? No, no, Absolutely. We are among friends, you can talk. <laughs> yeah. But so, yeah, so, it, and it was just a question of, um, it's my curiosity about these records. And, right. and, and then you find, and then I'm sort of looking into, right, what are the reasons why this record was important? Why do people like it? And um, right. that, that right. puts you on a journey of discovery. And I think that's part of the, the, the excitement of vinyl is that actually you're, you're forced to like stuff that you, or to listen to stuff that if it was on a stream, 
you probably go, okay, that's interesting. I've done that, tick that, yeah, now move yeah, on yeah. to something else. When you've actually got the album. I mean, I don't know about you. I used to sweat for hours over weather. I still do. This is something that's probably still deep ingrained in me from when, um, as a child, I had a limited amount of disposable income and I had 20 records I wanted to buy, but only six pounds to buy it. And you would sweat for hours. You would think, can, should I buy this one or that one? Oh, well, absolutely. You know, I mean, in the nicest possible way, I can, you know, I can now buy a few more records. And I still sweat over whether this record should be in my collection, whether it is worthy of being on the shelves. Um, and there's but no... That's so great, because it means you give it that investment, don't you? If you've got that yeah. wound up about it, then you really listen to it. And also, yeah. listen to it on vinyl, you feel a bit bad about taking the taking the needle off and, and you tend to listen to things the whole way through yeah, you do. and don't miss yeah. all the curios. You, know? you see, I've now thought of another reason why I envy younger people like you, Steve, you see, that you can you can approach the Rolling Stones or the Beatles or whatever and think, I don't know a lot about this, I'm going to go mm. and find out about it and I'm going to yeah. start a record one. I think how, my whole life has been a... Must that be? My, my whole life has been a bit of a, a dis, uh, you know, a musical discovery. I mean, I spent the first, you know, I grew up in, um, I was born in 1970, so grew up in the, in the 80s listening to pop music, and then by about 85, decided to, to go down a channel of, of heavy rock, which is something of a, a cul-de-sac, musically speaking, because you tend to just listen to, to, to heavy, heavy music at that, and, and at that point I did anyway, speak for myself. And so for 10 years, I, you know, I've got an encyclopedic knowledge about most um, heavy, heavy rock albums, but I didn't really explore much else. So I'm, by this time, I'm now 20, early 20s, and I still haven't played the first you know, uh, Rolling Stones albums. I haven't really explored very much of anything. And so you've then got an opportunity to everything you, you see is new and you're discovering it all yeah. for the first time. Wonderful. Um, you know, so and, you... heavy rock is just, you know, it is this, this cul-de-sac. So uh, um, it's like the Slayer album, uh, Rain in Blood. It's a fantastic album, wonderful, wonderful stuff. But nobody ever heard it and went, do you know what? We should make this faster, louder and heavier. Because it's about as fast and loud and as heavy as you can get. Right, um, right. They sort of won the competition from there. Yeah, you can't go anywhere after you that. Can't can you can't go anywhere else. You're in a cold sack. Yeah, yeah. So do you, you presumably spend an awful lot of your time just hanging around record shops? Well, that's, that's a, a dreadful accusation to make, obviously. But, um, um, well, I, I, um, yes, a little bit. Um, it's, it's something I've always done, I think. Um, when I was a kid, I used to spend every Saturday up in the, you know, the hour price or Parrot Records. Um, I'm very fortunate that I've got one just up the road, so that's that's very handy to pop right. in once a week. Um, and then if I'm on holiday, I don't know if you if you find this. If I'm on holiday, sometimes I'm sort of taking my family around um, whatever destination we might be. I don't know if you remember holidays; they we used to yeah. happen. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> very good. Um, by total coincidence, we may we may find ourselves next to a record shop. How did we get here? That's yeah. so strange. Yeah. I might as well pop in now. I'm here. Yeah, yeah. yeah. You know, obviously, I've had it planned in my phone the whole yeah. time. But you yeah, know. yeah. So how do you find the, the world of second-hand record shops where you must spend a lot of time trying to pick this stuff up? Yeah, do I, mean, you... I, do, I do find it far more interesting um, than I do going into new record shops, which, um, and because you never know what you're going to find. Um, right. But they're, they're a mixed bag. They're a reflection of their owner's personalities. And so oh, you really? can sort of assess that. So if, you've got, if you go into a shop and you find the guys, and, and they often are guys, um, they're into, uh, they've got a big collection of prog and can and, and stuff like that on the walls. And you know that that's going to be their specialist subject. You're not going to be able to find any bargains necessarily. You might find a very rare record, but you're not going to find any bargains. On the other hand, they might not be so quite so into, um, you know, 70s funk, or they might not know so much about 90s indie. And then it's a question of trying to work out the, the, the pricing and how, whether they're on top of things or not. And every, every, um, every, Every shop is quite an interesting uh, uh, journey. I mean, the, 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 the bellwether of whether you're going to um, go into a shop and find something good is to seek out No Parlay by Paul Young. <laughs> yeah, that's um, a running gag in the book, isn't it, No Parlay? I love that, because that's the record you always find in, in, charity, in charity shops too, in second you, record shops. You'll, you'll trip over them. They're, they're, they're propping up the door. They're, they, they're, they're you know, making sure wonky tables don't wonk anymore. Poor old um, Paul yeah. Young. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah. Um, and, and um, it's, it's there, they, were, they sold in the millions, so we don't need to be, feel too sorry for him. Um, but of course, you know, uh, people have, have um, put these um, on, on, the, uh, on, the, on the pile of um, junk and sold it to a record shop. So if you go into a record shop, my advice 
um, such that it is, is have a look, find the copy of No Parlay. If it's there for, a, you know, a couple of quid, two, three, four, five pounds, then you know he's, he's pricing his uh, stock fairly. If you see it at 16 pounds, run for the hills. <laughs> run for your, <laughs> turn good. on your heel and go. There's so many lovely details in the book. There's a bit where you talk about uh, uh, if you find a record that you really like and you can't afford it, take it out of the alphabetical order it's in and put it in, in foreign soundtracks or something where no one will find it till you can come back in two weeks oh, right. and got the money. I thought it was hilarious. You know, are there any other little things you've learned about well, I mean, record I'm, shop I'm etiquette? Yes, that as a, as a strategy. I was, that no, was, no, no, that was very funny. Turn, yeah. to, to be fair. Well, I mean, there's a lot of, um, I mean, uh, record collectors are a funny lot and we do a lot of things to justify to ourselves um, whether we should buy something. So one of the things I, I talk about is record collectors logic. Now this is applied when you find a record that is quite expensive. Yeah. And what you should do at that point, maybe you, you find a copy of um, uh, REM's Automatic for the People, um, uh, which is about, you know, 25, 30 quid or something. Or, may, or maybe the one after Monster, which was, you know, um, didn't sell so many. 90s vinyl, quite a quite a, a thing because it was you know it started oh, really? to fade out as a format so the, even yes, more expensive. um but they're not necessarily better you know it, it's, a, it's an interesting one so you look at that and you think well that's you know they want 40 quid for it on the other hand um this copy of um the isley brothers whatever it might be that's a tenner now if i buy the two together that's 25 pounds each so all of a sudden my from a record collector's logic perspective, I actually found a automa- you know, monster for £25. <laughs> You're not thinking that you're being ruinously ripped off on an Isley Brothers record, though. No, you've managed to... Well, you know, can you ever be ripped off buying an Isley no, Brothers record? No, you can't, actually. You no, cannot go wrong with an Isley Brothers yeah. record. Exactly, exactly. There. So what, what else you so, got there? So here's an example of 90s vinyl. This is... Um, this is oh, this Pulp, yeah. This is Pulp's uh, different class. Now, this is why why um, this record is fun. This is why vinyl's fun. Because Pulp, when, they, when this first came out, and this is quite a, um, this is not an inexpensive album anymore, um, but they, it came with interchangeable sleeves. So we got, and they go into this sort of aperture, um, and you can, and they are cardboard cutouts of the band. Um, so I'll show you the various. Yeah, fantastic. Yeah, yeah, there we yeah. Go. yeah, yeah. Um, and, and what they did was they put these cardboard cutouts of the band in real life situations. Um, and then, uh, you know, so this is something that is quite fun, I think. And, and, and the story around this, which is the, the actual cover, um, this is a wedding photo. And this is um, uh, two people whose wedding was crashed by the photographer. Um, and he said, can we put these, um, so if, if, you, if we look very carefully, there's actually some graying cardboard cutouts within uh-huh. a real, yeah wedding photo yeah, yeah and this this couple were actually getting married that day and the and the photographer said can we ha- just take a couple of pictures and they said oh okay yeah they sort of they knew him he was a friend of a friend and um so they agreed and they didn't know it was going to be used for the cover of a uh, pulp's different class until it came out oh, um, that's absolutely astonishing so they never cleared it with them no well they you know they they, they knew the, the photo was being taken and, and it was on their wedding day and that's, that's the bride's and groom's mothers and parents. And, and, and they so were risking a bit of a legal action there. Yeah, they would have been in the marriage. Yeah, well, yeah I think oh my God. Tickets when, uh, I think there was some sort of, uh, you know, uh, favour made at, at a later stage. Yeah, but, yeah. Well, then this, this, this takes us on to the, the point about 90s vinyl. Now, that's, a, that's an expensive album. And, and um, 90s album, you know, I can see with, with 1970s second-hand um, album, it's all analogue. There's no digital mastering. There's no... You know, because there wasn't digital consoles back then. So you know it's an analogue sound. And, and, and if you're yeah. very fussy about that sort of thing, which I can't say I am, but if you are, then you know you've got the original as it was meant to be heard. Now, with 90s, it was all, it's all done on um, digital pressing. So is there any point, is the question, to getting an original 90s pressing? Because they are quite expensive. Yeah, yeah. yeah. And, yeah. And, and, I, and so I argue in the book about the pros and cons of, of this. Here's, here's um, one of the exhibits for why you shouldn't bother getting an original. This Pulp's album before different class. This is a this will cost you fifty or sixty quid probably, uh, or more an original copy. But this is not an original copy. This is um, a repress, and yeah. this cost me you know uh, twenty quid or whatever it was. And it's got all the extra tracks. Um, the original copies of um, this album did not come with babies because it was a single. It appeared on a, on an EP. So 
this is a, a 90s album where it is demonstrably better not to get the original unless you're a real yeah, yeah. collector rather than just a yeah. Yeah. yeah 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 so um what else you got there what was some have you got the most ludicrous purchase you made or anything like that have you, anything you've you've lived to regret how well, did i ever spend this money well if we can we, let's veer away from the subject of uh, of records for a moment um the most lu ludicrous uh object is possibly this now this was a thing rock and roll comics I don't know if you can see this. There we go. Oh, right. Okay. Now here we have. Um, this was this was very much a thing. I've got I've got quite a few of these uh, that were bought. We got one by Queen here. There's the Rolling Stones. And this is the you know I mean I know that you know, Grail Marcus. There are people who who write very seminal uh, works. Um, yourself included, David. This this is um, you know maybe this has literary merit. Um, shall we? Shall we have a quick look? Oh, go on. Yes, go now, on. Later that day, three dots. <laughs> yes. As David belts out this classic White Snake track, Olsen is secretly recording, and Olsen's thoughts are, "He's ready and willing." <laughs> See what they did there. And perhaps the best part of this is the the key moment in the history of White Snake, when Rudy Sarzo, the bass player, is surprised when a portion of the stage collapses beneath him. And I don't know if you can see the beautifully portrayed- Oh, right. They've captured the drama. They yeah, captured. absolutely. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That, that's it's still playing, I know. Yeah. I mean, who needs, you know, any kind of, you know, we're redundant, great. David. There's no point when you have something as, as truly great as that, is there? <laughs> um, also, on the slightly more ludicrous side, um, let me. I thought I'd sh share with you this. Um, oh, right. Now, this is a cardboard guitar. It's a Gibson, isn't it? It's a Gibson. It is actually signed by Angus Young of ACDC. Oh, right, right. Oh, right. I'm quite proud, proud of this, but um, this was given to me when I appeared in a, an ACDC photo shoot oh, um, in about 1990-91. And uh, they were recording a song called That's the Way I Want to Rock and Roll, which um, uh, for those of you not keeping up with ACDC's um, output, it will not go down as one of their finest moments. But nevertheless, it was, um, a, a, you know, it was a single. And um, I went to the, see them at Wembley Arena and then they, they handed out some flyers in the queue outside. If you want to appear in a, an ACDC video, come back here at 10 o'clock in the morning tomorrow and we'll, we'll film it. So I did. And we had to hold up these, these cardboard guitars. There we are and sort of wave them. And then they had to shoot it from behind. So we had to turn around the guitars and then wave them that way. <laughs> the, magic of, the magic of television. And then, um, so I was very excited about seeing me on, on an actual ACDC video. Um, and then they played a clip from it on the chart show because that was the only TV show back then that would actually play um, music videos. And they just showed the band and they didn't show any of the crowd, so I, I couldn't really make myself out. So I, I hadn't seen this for 20, 25 years until it appeared on DVD. Bought the DVD, played it. And then I saw the band were actually outside um, the NEC in Birmingham, whereas my video had been shot at Wembley. And I subsequently found out that um, they had to reshoot the whole thing um, in the Birmingham NEC. So, actually, so you're not there you're at all. You're not at all. You're not I there at all. The video it's heartbreaking. At all. <laughs> at least you have a cardboard cutout guitar. Superb. You do. That's a, you, could be worse. Have... Signed by Angus Young. That's a fine souvenir. Can we uh, get, just very briefly get back to records? Is the one record that you wish you owned? Is there the one record out there, some is fabulous it? collectible <laughs> item that you just... You no, no, I, I just like That's going all. into to record. I mean, I've got a want list. Um, and, but, but, you know, I think you can take, you can take joy in everything. Now, now um, here, here's uh, an example of um, something actually, let's, let's, let's take this one. B.B. King. Yeah, oh, right, yeah. So this, this is a sort of distillate of where I come from, really. You open this up, this is Indianola Mississippi Seeds. This is not a very well-known record. I, I found this for less than a tenner in a shop. Now it's got, it's got um, the, um, it reprints his birth certificate. Albert King's his dad, not the Albert King, I assume. No. Um, and it's got his, you know, his prints. And then, and then it says in here, Carol King appears on this record and then you look at it and you think well that's actually this has come out in 1970 which is before no, no. Oh, okay cool. yeah so and then and so this is sort of quite intriguing and then you play that it, it's um it's leon russell appears on this as well 
And the, the story around this record, which is something I, I talk around in the book, is that, you know, he, this, is, this is his sort of crossover album to try and uh, appeal to um, not just a black audience, but a white audience. And this is Leon Russell giving me a helping hand. There's a beautiful track on the back of that, Leon Russell's Hummingbird, which is just, just a sensational um, track. This is something I'd have never, never really discovered unless I found this, this record and, and, and uh, in, in, a, in a bargain bin in yeah. some final shop. Yeah. That, that's what's exciting for me about, about records. Um, right. I mean, you know, like here's, here's Black Sabbath's um, debut. I mean, Sabbath have a fantastic story. Um, you know, you've got the, the swirly uh, yeah. version. Yeah. Of this one's got, uh, this used to be owned by uh, Kathy Davis. I don't know if we can see that. <laughs> so, if you're watching, Kathy, now you know where it is. So, yeah, I've got your, I've got your record, Kathy. If you yes. want um, but that, you know, that's great. I mean, that, 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 I got half price on that because it's got writing on it. You know, oh, uh, yeah. that sort of thing. But, didn't the only, uh, didn't the only, didn't the only recently find out the identity of the woman on the cover on the front? That's of right, that. they did. Yeah. I mean, and I think Black Sabbath's story in itself is, is, is fascinating. Again, it's another story we tell in the book, but it's, it's, it, they had an insane strategy for trying to get a gig. Um, they, they, you know, they, they, um, when they're starting up, they would hang outside a venue in the hope that the, the band that was booked wouldn't turn up. <laughs> and it's this, a long shot, isn't it? I mean, it's a bit of a long shot, but, and yet it actually It worked. did happen, didn't it, one night? It worked. Right. Jethro Tull did not turn up yeah. one night, and they're there, and they start playing on a storm. And, um, and then they turn up. Jethro Tull say, thanks very much, we'll go back on now. And, and so it actually worked for them. And, and then Ian Anderson then asked Tony Iommi to join the band, his band, for a minute. Oh, he uh, did, and, didn't and, it? And, yeah. and it was... I mean, it, it, it lasted four days... And in fact, he and appears on Rock and Roll Circus, doesn't he? He's on the Rolling Stones. Yeah, yeah, yeah. What are four days to join Jeff Rotan? If yes, you could absolutely. choose any four days to join Jeff Rotan. <laughs> absolutely, that's really yeah, good it would point. Be four, wouldn't it? <laughs> you would. You're going to meet Eric Clapton, John Lennon, Yoko and the Rolling Stones, Taj Mahal, mm -hmm. whatever. Right. And, what, and, and, and your previous experience is hanging around outside venues trying to get a <laughs> Hoping yeah. that people are going to turn But up. then Tony Iommi, the guitarist, he goes, well, do you know what? I'm... I'm fed up with being with this show-off flamboyant front man. I'm going to join Aussie. Yes, where I, I'll, be able, I'll be able to attract attention. You tell the story about him, uh, Tony Omi, having his industrial accident and he loses the tip of a finger, doesn't he? Which well, is yeah. why he plays the guitar very slackened strings, which is what produced their entire sound, which is another extraordinary little event, isn't it? Yeah, I mean, it, 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 he's not the only person it's happened to. I mean, Will Carruthers in his book, um, Playing the Bass with Three Left Hands, is, is, you know, it's based in Birmingham, and, and he talks of, of being in, that fact, in, a, in a sheet metal factory and going to a pub where he saw... A, one, of, one of his work colleagues got his, his hand sliced and because um, they removed the safety mechanism in order to get things going through quickly. And he goes to a pub afterwards and he sees a whole load of men in the pub, all with industrial accidents and fingers really? missing. And so this was not an uncommon thing. And yeah, Tony Iommi, the day he's due to, um, to quit his job at the sheet metal factory uh, and become a musician, and he's left-handed, he, he loses some digits in his right hand, which is the worst hand, you know, if there's ever a bad hand to lose it on when you're a left-handed guitarist, it's that hand. Yeah. And yeah, he, he makes thimbles um, to go on the tips of his fingers, um, rubber thimbles. That's right, and, yeah. And he has to lose, and he has to slacken um, the strings um, as he goes on in order to make that sound. And, and that is what gave birth eventually to that. Yeah, it's that extraordinary, extraordinary yeah. story. Yeah. yeah. Have you got some... You got some what are you, go on, carry on, carry on. What you got there? Uh, well, ne next one. Should we have another uh, flame? Come on. Oh, oh now, right, flame. Now, this is a bugbear of yours, I think, um, uh, David. Oh, I don't like coloured vinyl. I know, I, I, I did read I that. Don't, I don't hold with it at all. But anyway, go on. No. This just happened to be uh, the only uh, format at the time you could actually get this album on. Oh, really? Like, was it? Yeah. Um, and, and the Flaming Lips, I think, are an interesting band because they come across like slightly disinterested stoners. Um, and I think that's really misleading. Um, you've got Michael Ivins, who brilliantly um, did a Brian May and made his own guitar. But because he's not a rocket scientist, it didn't work. It was rubbish. rubbish. And I just, I just quite like the story that he tried and failed. Yes. Like and yeah. Wayne Coyne once, once queued for three days 
for a Led Zeppelin ticket. Now that is not, you know, this is a determined man here. This is not yeah. a man who is just going to be, yeah, whatever. Um, and so, and then they've been going six or seven years and they're in, they play a gig in front of six people. Now, you know, imagine if you've been doing this and you've got six subscribers, that would be pretty soul destroying. <laughs> um, You've got to admire people. It's like Pulp. It was 15 years when it was that took Pulp to be successful. Yeah, I mean, it's incredible, they, isn't it? their tour van eventually had travelled nearly half a million miles by the time it gave up the ghost. So I, I think, you know, there's a story in Flaming Lips that we perhaps don't... See, yeah. do, you, do you, if there are six people in the audience, it's an interesting thing, this, isn't it? Do you carry on with the show? Because I think, I think in the theatre... I think the the old rule of thumb used to be, and there might be actors watching this who can confirm or deny, that if the cast outnumber the audience, you don't have to do the show. Ah, that's probably a very so arcane got... bylaw, isn't it? Yeah. <laughs> uh, whereas, you know, it, 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 six people in the audience, there are more than the in the audience than there are in the flaming lips. So you've got to carry on. Yeah, and it seems doubtful that have had the, the, the dressed up bunnies and the, and the light show and the confetti as well. well so. But you probably find an audience of six would be really appreciative would and it? really engaged. I'm and sure would, they uh, would. You know what I mean? Would, the, um, the wouldn't Stones leave. Get such they? a good view. <laughs> yeah. The Rolling Stones, they don't like being in small audiences because they, 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 they can see the... Oh, the, absolutely. They, They're not used yeah. to that. Yeah. It's, it's years since they've seen that. Yeah, yeah. definitely. Let, let's rattle through a, a few more um, just to... Just Go on. Before everyone. Here's um, Aretha Franklin, someone else we talk about in the book. Right, she, right. Here's something that, that I thought was interesting. Uh, the track listing on here... Um, great album, a couple of really good Beatles covers, Let It Be, Eleanor Rigby, it's got Son of a Preacher Man on there. Fool on the Hill, track five, right at the end, Fool on the Hill. Right. This is a song that never came out. It's on the sleeve. But it's not on the it. record. So it's, on, it's, it's, it's not on the oh, record. Right. Look on the, uh, on the, uh, the I mean, by the time pressing the, pressing the record, it's been replaced by something, uh, Sit Down and Cry. So we've got there um, an example of, you know, they're printing off the, the record sleeve. Before, really early. Yes. Before they even print it. Well, they probably couldn't clear it or something like that. Yes. I yeah, think well, they'd already got there's two, a little, two There's a little Feet album where there's a, a, a song listed on the back and all the lyrics, and it's not on the record. It, came, it appeared on the next record, I think, something like ah. that. I can't remember which one it was. Go on. What you got there? You'll know oh, that, you? Oh, oh that's that's right. Right. It's the American yeah. edition, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So and, um, famously, you know, they papered over the butcher cover. Yeah, yeah. Um, yeah. This is not one of those very valuable butcher covers. I mean, if there's ever a record you wouldn't mind having, probably, you know, from from a sheer worth perspective. But what I like about this is it actually you won't be able to, may not be able to see this, but it does have a, a pasted cover. This is this has not been printed. This is they pasted. It's just a sheet. It's a sheet. Just stuck paper, over, isn't it? Stuck yeah. over. They obviously got and and so that you can that is the history of that record. Uh, where they had to pulp a load of the, the butcher covers because they, they were offensive to, to the American audience. Um, and then quickly had to paste over. This is the only Beatles money that, uh, Beatles record that lost money because they had the, the production. Oh, really? Oh, that's really? interesting. Really? Uh, and, and then, you know, on a similar, if we're going to be, there's the, the Happy Mondays. Um, right. This is, a, this is a, a sleeve that was um, cancelled because they used a load of sweet wrappers in the making. Oh. And they didn't get any clearance. Oh. Um, <laughs> And then had to completely remake the cover. Um, the Rolling Stones, of course, you'll be familiar with. Some, some well. girls. Yeah, yeah. Um, so, so they were in, now let me get this straight. They, re, they removed Lucille Ball, didn't they? Is that what they. Yeah, there was, um, there was several. Um, oh, the, were they really? Did on here? Um, uh, didn't like it. And there is, a, I've got, this is the original uh, where yeah. before it had been um, removed. Yeah. So has I'm, he got the, where, where's Lucille Ball? Is she on there? She'll be on there. Um, yeah. I don't know how you are on um, on fifty. Uh, oh right, no, no, don't worry. Uh, yeah. no, oh, that's fantastic. That must be very valuable. Yellow, one of them with the yellow hair, but they sort of um, messed around with the images as well, just to yeah, just yeah. really annoy them. Uh, but yeah, subsequent copies of that then come with a sort of cover under under construction yeah. idea. Um, and yeah, so I mean, you know, I don't want to go on forever. Here's here's Bob Dylan's. Uh, blood on the tracks. I've got, I've got a story about Bob Dylan, which isn't in the... Have you, uh, sorry, I'm going to interrupt you. Have you got the, uh, one, the Blood on the Tracks with the original sleeve notes? Ooh. Because Pete yes. Hamill, who died only the other day, 
Yeah. Wrote the original sleeve notes. Yes, he did. Got, got a Grammy Award. I think got a Grammy Award for best sleeve notes. And then they took the sleeve notes off. Is that right? I think I'm right in saying right. that. Am I, I right, I Mark? You're the did they, I think so. I don't remember them being on there. Did they ever reappear? Well, they're possibly only on the American copies or something. Yeah. I can't remember. Um, uh, yeah, no. I, 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 but there you go. I thought this was a fairly mundane, ordinary copy of Blood on the Tracks. Oh, so, there's um, always a story. Grammy. There's always a story. <laughs> So I, I do, to give you an idea of how there's always a story about an LP uh, cover, and uh, Mark and I were talking about this recently. I did the thing about Abbey Road when it was the whatever anniversary it was, 50 years or whatever. And I, I wrote a thing in the, um, uh, Mark Lewison, the great Mark Lewison was doing a presentation about the, the van that's on the cover of, of Abbey Road, and you know, the, and that the guy, the reason it's there is the guy had gone on holiday for two weeks, and in those days you didn't have yellow lines down Abbey Road, so you could park it there and you could leave it. So I wrote a thing in Radio Times and mentioned this. And the reach of Radio Times is such that the guy who owned the van, who's still around, got in touch and said, No, I wasn't away on holiday that week. <laughs> I used to, but I parked it there and then I used to go down and see my mother and then I'd come back and park it again. And you thought, you know, this is just a snap. Six pictures were taken of this one day in 1969. And still, things we didn't know about it keep mm -hmm. on emerging. I love all that. Which, like which the little, the, the VW, Marvel. the white VW turned up for sale, didn't it? Well, well that was the, v yeah. sorry, it was the VW I was talking about, not the yeah, So was the VW. VW. Right, yeah, yeah well, the, no, the VW. VW is now in a car museum in Holland, I think, or Northern Germany or something like that. It's in a VW museum, I think. Yeah. And this is why Mark Lewison's life is probably quite far more difficult than he ever thought it would be. Well, I guess. So. Well, we can't say saying about Mark Lewison. He must be in agony about the idea that whenever he meets people, he said, did you know so-and-so? Yeah, and yeah, it's, it's something he left out. I don't want to know anymore. It's, it's Dr. Johnson's <laughs> dictionary. I actually, had, um, I actually had a moment like that where um, I, I did a tour of Liverpool last October and I was talking to the taxi driver and he, and he said the first place that um, uh, Le Lennon McCartney met um, it's said to be at the in that um, the, 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 the fair, the school well, fair. Well, Wilton, Wilton Fair, yeah. Yeah, yeah, yeah. but actually, um, and, and there is a, a, a sort of, it's a footnote in Mark Lewison's book. Um, there's a possibility that it was at a news agent's where one of them was doing a paper round and they, they spoke, yeah, yeah. spoke to each other, but they couldn't quite narrow it down because it was called Acres and, or, some, or Acres, something like that. And, and they couldn't quite work out because there wasn't a news agent owned by this Mr. Acker for you know, for, uh, except four miles away, except that the the local Liverpudlian guide said, well, he used to own it, and we, and then they still called it that, even though he, even though it was gone. somebody else's. And so, and so actually, I've got a photo of this very nondescript. <laughs> you, it might be a dry cleaners now or something. I, I have the they got a plaque up? I bet they have. <laughs> <laughs> You'd think he'd be very quick to uh, capitalise on that, you know. You can't move for blue plaques in Liverpool, I think. No, no. No, you can't. You Terrific. Can't. And statues. So traditionally with these, with these things, what, what we ask people to do, we finish by telling us, what, what's the greatest record ever made, in, in your opinion? Over to you. Thank you. Well, um, whether it's the greatest ever made, who knows? Oh, yeah, we can I do have um, a, a real soft spot for this, um, this classic um, of what's now known as Desert Rock. This is an album called The Blue Garden. Mm -hmm. And it's by a band called Masters of Reality. All oh, right, okay. Masters of Reality? Masters yeah. of Reality. Okay. Chris Goss was in this. Now, Ginger Baker joined them on their second album, on an album called Sunrise for the Suffer Bus. Uh, and why not? And this is a beautiful album. It's, you know, you talked about lyrics just now um, on uh, appearing on album covers where the, the song didn't appear. Well, this has got that. There's a song that only appeared later on on this album um, called Doraldina's Prophecies. Um, and they've got the lyrics on here, but it didn't make the final cut. This is, right. this is produced by Rick Rubin. Um, it's from about 1988, I'm gonna say. Oh, yep. And uh, it's, it started off, if, if not for this, we would not have Queens of the Stone Age. We would not have that sort of, it, it's a sort of, it's a, it's, it's a lovely blend of blues rock, cream, um, but also moving on into that sort of Black Sabbath-y um, uh, genre as well. It's, it's just a, a fantastic album. And I've, I've, I've owned several copies of this. Um, that is the greatest record ever made.
if you say if you say say yep. so it absolutely has to be true it's <laughs> been it's been lovely talking to you hold your book up once more for yes. the uh, for the benefit of, of anybody who wants to know terrific book. book thoroughly recommended every record tells a story by steve carr uh, available online and in usual online. outlets it's, uh, it's, and, uh, yeah online uh, we, we're selling it through um, i40 which is my publisher um and you can get it online right now Okay, brilliant. Lovely to talk to you, Steve. Great to talk to you, Steve. Likewise, Fantastic. You. Thank Cheers. you. Cheers. Bye. 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 Bye Word in your attic. A Zoom with a view.